And we got to click got it, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll uh, thank you guys for uh, showing up um, uh, this evening. So I'm, you know, as, as all of you know, I'll just hand the, the mic over to our consultants here, but um, appreciate everybody, um, you know, coming out tonight. So. Uh, with that, Nate, uh, if, if you want to just charge ahead, that's fine. Uh, if you wanted to do a brief summary of where we've been, maybe that might be good too, but it's mm -hmm. completely up to you. Well, I mean, I'll just remind folks, it was great to have the video. Thanks for sending that around. Um, you know, I sort of went, moved quickly through that and got a chance to, you know, see how we wrapped up. We wrapped up with an impassioned discussion about the importance of on-street parking and the challenge that's gonna be uh, with particularly on the state road, um, but the importance of that relative to the property value, accessibility, uh, the feeling of the street and all of those things. So, you know, we will, we will do as much as we can with zoning. There are limits to what zoning can accomplish. Um, but as we've talked about with parking, um, it, go, it definitely goes beyond zoning you know government plays a role here and street design and you know whether we allow folks to do uh you know more centralized shared parking those types of things um so you know if you think about every every place you go to that's you know really walkable and that you enjoy visiting and getting out of your car <laughs> and not going back to your car for you know a good four hours and seeing all kinds of great things you know all those places have uh you know, not everybody has parking on their lot. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a system, it works on a district level. Um, and it's really important for us to think about what the town can advocate for and the resources they can provide alongside the tools that we put into zoning. Um, so that was really kind of where we, we ended up last time. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen and bring us to that issue of parking. Um, and we can talk about what was drafted here. Let me find my, do I need to be made a host or something to share? I'll investigate. Or am I just not seeing the button? You shouldn't have to generally, it's not down at the bottom. When you go to the bottom, it doesn't have a got share it. screen. Got okay. it, got it, got it. Too many different applications here. Thank you for that, Megan. Thanks for the reminder. Okay, so is that now up? Okay. Yes. So here we are on page eight, uh, approximately halfway through, so that's good. We made it halfway last time, more or less. And so we've talked about a number of different ways to get at this parking issue. And our work on this in many different places has evolved a bit. Um, and we, we've, there's more than one way to go at this. And one of the things that we're, we sort of remember back to our early discussions, we're trying to do this by right. You know, we're trying to the best of our ability. There will be special permits as an option sprinkled throughout this, but where we do offer the special permit, it's really for the benefit of, of everybody. It's not meant to be more of a burden. It's meant to provide opportunities, you know, that you might not necessarily be able to get to any other way. Um, so, you know, with that in mind and recognizing that site plan review is gonna be taking place, um, the approach that we've put here is really to put is to really lean on the review process and not any sort of outdated or one size fits all parking ratios. Um, so this is a little bit more of a sophisticated way of doing this. 
Um, and again, it doesn't uh, prescribe a set amount of spaces on site for a particular use. It basically says to the applicant, give us a parking report and tell us how you're gonna do it. And if we think it's gonna work, we're gonna approve it. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's certainly a departure from the way most zoning bylaws work, um, but I would argue that most zoning bylaws do not work effectively you know, towards what we're trying to achieve here. Um, so what this basically says is, you know, submit a parking report. These are the, the requirements of that report. Um, you have options here for, to account for off-street parking. There are requirements for parking lot screening. A little figure here that talks about how that looks if you do put it up against the street, if you're allowed to do that. And the rest of this really, you know, does kind of go through design aspects of it. Um, and then we get into shared driveways. So I won't go, go towards the shared driveway thing. Um, so this is, this is really it, you know, give us a report, tell us how you think it's gonna work. If we think it's gonna work, we're gonna approve it. The parking needs to be in the back. If you really wanna put it on the side, you can do that through a special permit. And there are some design requirements associated with that. That's really the, the crux of it. Nate, may I ask a question? Yes, please, Pat. Uh, when we say, give us a report and tell us why you think your design for parking is going to work. We're going to have to look at it in a way on square footage of the building because what they design their building to be used for right then might not be what it's used for 10 years hence. And so that's a conundrum that I see. This parking is a conundrum. That is absolutely correct. Um, and, you know, again, if we think of the, of the places that we love that, you know, like look like what we're trying to achieve here, you know, those uses change a lot and they, they go in and out from office to, to, to retail, to, you know, print shop, to Photoshop, to small veterinarian, whatever, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and, you know, they don't have the opportunity to expand their parking lot. Um, they have to figure out a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what this is really trying to account for is really the reality of that situation. And I, and I think it's important, Pat, to remember when we decided to move towards more form-based code and going for what the shapes and sizes of the building are and making sure they can handle all the uses. And I, I think that's really important here that you know we, we're not gonna get parking for every single use that ever comes in there because that's what we got now. Yeah, Jim, I'm throwing the question out because there have been a couple of people who weren't with us back then. I and I think the question is going to come up as we discuss it. So I want all ears. Oh, okay, hear, okay, I understand. I, now I understand. <laughs> yeah. But we have accommodated parking and that's why we have acres and acres and acres of paving uh -huh. in Davis Straits. Yeah, and, and, you know, admittedly, you know, be very upfront here, admittedly, this is not an approach that everybody's comfortable with. And there, there are other ways to do this, but they're, they're much more clunky. You know, you provide examples of calculations for shared parking and, you know, it's just a sort of a much more prescriptive um, way to do it. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's, you um, you know, again, you're, you're trying to put something that's super predictive on a situation that isn't always predict, always predictable. Um, and that that's the conundrum, Pat, as you, you know, as you call it, uh, trying to trying to solve this issue. By the way, Nate, I, I really did mean it when I said I'm bringing it up for ears yeah. that weren't here to hear our discussion earlier. Yeah. Because there to do what we really want to do, there's no way you can absolutely prescribe. Yep. No, and, and to be honest, you know, when when we've worked in mixed use districts that already look like what you're trying to achieve, and we've done zoning reform for them, you know, half the time 
they throw out the parking. They just throw it out. Like, we just can't deal with this anymore. There are no minimum parking requirements. You know what you need to do. Make it work. It's worked for, you know, 50 years already here. So we're moving on. I mean, you're not there yet because it hasn't been built. Mm -hmm. But like, just to give you an example of like, once you get to that point, a lot of these municipalities are just throwing it out. Just like, we're just not doing this anymore. It doesn't reflect reality. We're moving on from the parking discussion. Okay. Uh, excuse me, I have one thing to add. I think we should put on the mem minutes that we also need to start looking at and in, in moving in this direction of shared vehicles, elect zip cars, every other kind of shared vehicle way to do it to help us deal with the parking. They were not just, we should understand that, yes, they're going to figure it out, but there's all kinds of great ways to do it. And they need to, we need to make them make the developers figure it out. But we should specify that, you know, we're, we're looking for those innovative parking methods. Yeah, we can certainly include examples of, you know, could include, but is not limited to the following, that sort of thing. Because we had mentioned that before. We also, and this, I don't know whether it go under parking or not, but we were also looking at charging stations because right. more and more electric vehicles are going to be out there. Again, I don't know whether that comes under the parking part of it or where. I mean, it's an interesting evolving issue because, um, you know, the case law around accessory uses um, is lengthy and it has this really um, sort of vague definition and it defines an accessory use as something that's, you know, customarily accessory to a particular primary use. And electric charging stations are not customary to anything at this point. They're, you know, they're sort of brand new. Um, so it's a good point um, to bring that up. And, it, and if that's something that the town's looking for, it may be worth, um, calling that out sort of in the allowable use section or something like that. So this second section here just talks again about the location of the parking. We want it behind the building. Um, we're providing a relief valve in case, you know, something's just weird about the lot or something comes up where some of the parking needs to go to the side of the building. Um, they can do that with a special permit. Um, and when you do that, it needs to be screened appropriately. And so we've got this little dot diagram that we like to use where, you know, what's in, there's two things important about this. One is that there's a barrier that's, you know, not ugly, that, that is pleasant to look at, that, you know, sets the edge between where the pedestrian is supposed to be and where the cars are, but also that the pedestrian can see into the parking lot. Um, you know, a lot of standards way back when would say that the parking lots need to be screened. And so they just put up a giant wall of arborvitae trees across it. And that's, that's not necessarily safe. It's certainly not inviting. Um, so we're just being very clear about, you know, how this has to be visually connected. And there are some standards here in terms of how the, um, parking lot is uh, designed. One of the things, Jed, we probably want to go through with you, and I don't think this necessarily needs to be a discussion for the full group, is just, you know, this is one of those tricky areas where we want to make sure the relationship to the standards in the full bylaw, like the distinction is clear, um, and what we want to use. So again, I don't think it's a there's nothing really controversial here. The goal here is just to create some greenery within the parking lot um, to break it up visually, create some shade, that type of thing. I mean, I think we all know what we want, uh, but just from a mechanics standpoint in the bylaw, we wanna make sure that there's no confusion about which standards get applied. 
And then this final provision down here, number three, just basically affirms what we've all been talking about is that um, parking that's offsite can be accounted for. So if there is on-street parking, you can account for that. And if there was, for example, if there were restrictions on the on-street parking for the number of hours somebody could be there, that would fold into that parking report that you know, gets supplied by the applicant saying there's four spaces out there, but it's two hour parking. We expect it to turn over at least you know, five times a day. So that four spaces really serves almost as 20 spaces over the course of the day. You know, those are the types of things that get built into the narrative. And basically we're just saying, you know, the parking is located within 800 feet of the property. Um, there has to be an identifiable route to get there. You know, nobody has to hop over a fence or, you know, do anything like that to get to their parking space. Um, the parking, uh, area is going to be uh, compatible for people with disabilities in accordance with the law. Um, and then where offsite parking is proposed, um, there's an agreement between the two property owners. Um, and importantly here, this, this comes up a lot when we're doing this work. Somebody in the conversation will inevitably say, well, we need to put that on the deed. And we say, no, 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 you're not we're not putting this on the deed. If you need an enforceable private contract or a memorandum of agreement between folks, that's fine. But putting it on the deed is a non-starter for property owners. They're not gonna do a shared parking agreement if they think there's gonna be a deed restriction going forward. It's not, it's not, it doesn't make sense to do that. Sort of, sort of an important little legal distinction there. Do you think that would be the case, Nate, if there was some bonus for offering that kind of connection? Say, say that again, Tony? For the guy who is on the outside in your diagram to create access for the guy on the inside because he's landlocked. Yep. Um, if I were the guy on the inside, I'd want to know that that access was going to stay. And if I were a guy on the outside, I'd want to know that I got some benefit for giving up the spaces I gave up to make the connection. Is Tony, there some thought about how you might create a bonus? I got a suggestion. What is it, Jim? It's, it, it covers Tony's point and also another point. I think we need to consider uh, transfer of development rights because I, Someplace in this area that's all private property, we're going to create a park or maybe two parks on private land. And they're not going to give it up unless they get a bonus for something else. And this Tony's issue could be the same thing. You know, somebody that's doing the egress into what we need and they're giving away their land that they can't develop. We have, Tony called it a bonus, but I, I'm calling it. A make, give them something else to make it's the same thing give them some some way to give that up because if not we're, we're not going to change what we have we have to give them the, the ability to do that a little bit and i i, I was just want to throw the idea i know in the original cape cod commission they had parks all down right by where the rotary is going but uh i'm not sure that's going to happen now but we might want to create a little residential park where all the uses around that are residential now that we have this multifamily development they could put a residential development in the middle of this thing and uh, have a little small park in front of it and whoever the developer that gave that land up needs to be getting greater density and that's the same way we can solve tony's problem long-winded answer i'm sorry to take up too much time well i'll try to speak to those there's sort of two questions here you know one is can there there be some sort of reward. So if you're the person who's providing access, um, you know, to, to somebody else, and are you talking about the parking or the access, Tony? It was more, I was thinking about it more in terms of the access, because the guy in the middle is going to know his value is dependent on that connection. Mm -hmm. And so what is there that we've done to make it other than the obviously there could be a private transaction but we yeah. could do something publicly to incent the guy on the outside 
to want to make that kind of connection like people have done downtown. But I suspect that was just, you know, there for so long that it's become, uh, I don't know, what is it, adverse possession or, you know, that's right. how it is. Not to mention you would you'd want to promote it before the guy in the middle even shows up, right? The guy on the end, you're kind of asking him to preserve the ability to make those sort of connections in the future. Yeah. So we so, so they're yeah. thinking ahead. So they're thinking ahead. So I wonder, Nate, is there some scenario where there's this notion of setting aside portion the buildable portions of the lot for future connections and or um, common open space or whatever the right terminology for it would be. How can you then utilize that to still achieve a higher density? Are we giving them additional height? You know, what, what is the, the bonus that you're giving them? But sort of building into it some language of it would encourage someone to set aside a little park, for instance, right? You know, yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not to, sure, I'm not sure what the bonus would be on a development. So there's lots of different kinds of bonuses, right? So and one of them is a development bonus. And we don't have a lot of size to play with here. You know, it's not like we can, we're not building 30 story buildings and say, oh, you get an extra five if you do this, you know, so it's we don't have a lot to give away in terms of, of density and height um, and that type of thing. Not that it's impossible. We just don't have a lot to, to play with. I mean, another tool in the toolbox that we haven't discussed at all because it's not zoning are tax incentives, you know, tax credits and, and those types of things. So the municipality can step forward and say, you know, if you're preserving access um, across your side lot lines, um, you know, maybe there is some sort of financial um, credit that goes with that. And then the last way to do it is to, is to simply require it, um, which, you know, is, is all stick and no carrot. Um, and just say that when you build, um, you have to show where there's a possible future connection you know, to your, to your parking area in the rear. Um, so there's different ways to do that. Well, also, and I'll just throw this out there. I mean, right now, <clears throat> it's not as though we have a bunch of little lots in the back that do not have frontage on an existing street. I mean, we've, we've, that's how it's set up now. So, I mean, this, this scenario really only becomes an issue if people start subdividing, uh, which may not be an issue. Uh, people may want to keep the parcels that they have and, and certainly develop a back parcel, but not necessarily subdivide it and, and sell it off. Um, so a lot of this hopefully won't be a huge problem if we maintain ownership or even you know expand ownership over uh, the existing parcels. <clears throat> hey, Jim. I, I just want to mention that if you take a look that, that is true if you look at the development ending at uh, uh, Spring Bars Road, but if you go all the way up to Jones Road and you're looking at the, the frontage there with little teeny lots in front and the Rose family and all their things controlling a really big block in back, you know, it, 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 and I can tell you, Pete, that's going to be an early issue, not a later issue. It's just it's just the way it's going to be because there's some really big land there yep. and the property owners are going to start figuring out how way to do it by getting together and merging things and doing things so that's coming at us yeah point being i think i see mergers of lots being far more likely than subdivision of existing lots that's my opinion Uh, we'll think about whether we can provide any assurances or bonuses for these connections, but I don't think there's much in the way on the development side that we can do. And I'm trying to think of any other relief that we could provide, um, but that may take some thought. And, and it might still be worth even considering, you know, requiring it versus encouraging it and just suggesting it's in everybody's best interest. You know, even if your short-term development doesn't require, you know, a, a egress through a neighboring lot, long-term it might be to your benefit to have both been planning ahead for it, even though at the moment you have a driveway coming into your lot. And it's the only way it'll ever get done. You know, words like encourage just get blown over, right? So. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. If you're going to have a building that doesn't have frontage, you must have that access, period. And again, I mean, the only way that would happen is if there was a subdivision and you'd have to make that, um, you know, a, a, a part of the agreement for the subdivision that you're providing that access. <clears throat> Okay. So this, uh, there was a little formatting issue here. You can see the section header um, got wrapped around the text box. So apologies for that. Um, but this is a new section here. And this came up, um, Tony had brought this up in our last discussion, you know, interest about talking about if there are gonna be any new streets. Um, so there could be a scenario um, where a new street gets put through, you know, one of the larger plazas um, to create new frontage um, in those areas. And, and we had some preliminary discussion that we tabled, you know, about what that street would look like. Um, and we just went very basic here um, and called for um, a minimum 40 foot right away uh, with and a maximum of 50 with um, eight feet of sidewalk on either side, plus five for a uh, planted buffer. So that's, you know, basically whatever the right of way is, you're, you're losing 26 feet um, to the pedestrian area. And what's left over would theoretically be the, the, the pavement, the, the travel lane. Um, so that would be, you know, in the case of a 40 foot uh, right of way, uh, you've got 14 feet left, um, which is, is pretty ample. And, you know, I think one of the, the issues that Tony raised is, you know, is that too much? If we're, if we're going to be having folks create um, new streets, should we be more careful about, you know, how big these are and what we're calling for? Um, so that, that's up for discussion. This was a very sort of basic approach. Um, but we certainly have, you know, examples of street sections and other things that could be included in this um, to, to illustrate a variety of designs that are more detailed. Um, Nate, I have a question here too, because um, why are we calling for the sidewalks to be eight feet wide? We usually yeah. want to have a minimum of eight feet when we're looking at it, like any particular sidewalk. So um, that allows for, if you're gonna put, a, you know, outdoor benches, or if you're gonna put a street tree in, or if you're gonna put something like that, that leaves that, that four to five feet of walking area for folks uninterrupted. Um, so that's sort of a, a bare minimum. I think like whenever you look at um, a lot of the, the sort of walkable areas, like in, in my home city, for example, in Providence, you literally see like the con, you know how they, they make the concrete squares. They're, they're four by four, they're four feet by four feet. And you'll see two of those sort of as a minimum on these sidewalks. So those are eight foot wide and that's comfortable for people to walk, you know, in opposite directions, side by side, you know, giving you plenty of space. If somebody is traveling in a wheelchair or has a baby stroller, or like that type of thing, that's that's usually what we're looking for. I mean, more is better. You have you can you can do more with more. You can have outdoor seating, and you can and that's in our frontage design standards. Uh, but for this, we set that as the minimum. Well, the reason I'm questioning that is because I think. Um, I probably am envisioning the same question that Tony has, that if you're taking away this much land to put minor streets going through, are we going to undercut our desire to have that done perhaps by requiring too much? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, a it's, it's sort of making the comparison about the some of the little alleys that bring you back uh, into parking in the downtown mm -hmm. versus a real street that has sidewalks both sides. You know, that's a very different animal. And it means that 
there's a gap in the building facade of at least that width. And this might be where we, we need to do a better job of differentiating between what we're implying by a street versus what you're describing, which is almost more like a like a parking access lane, right? Like in, in Nate's diagram just above there, I know it wasn't meant for this point, but the street is the thing that sort of runs along the fronts of the buildings. But the, the way you get the, the little part the little access lanes that get you back to the parking, those aren't streets, right? That, that's not what's being required. So we might wanna be very clear about the difference between a street and a, you know, lot access or something, just to make sure that point is a little bit clearer. So I think Tony, that was what, what when you were describing it the other day, I was, I was picturing, you were thinking, you know, even just to turn into my lot to get back behind my buildings, I gotta leave a 40 foot right of way, right? And I, I don't think that's really necessarily what we're trying to describe, but I don't think we've done a good job of trying to make that clear. And I, I think that the second way of asking that, I'm sorry, Pat. I'm, Go ahead. Uh, the, the second question to ask ourselves is if, uh, if there's a back building and you'd like to be able to sell that not in a condominium format, then uh, you need a street with frontage mm -hmm. in, in order to make it happen. And, and how do we want to think about those things? Because I, I don't think we want to incent turning the little lane into something that's 50 feet wide. Mm -hmm. That's, that was my point, because our normal right of way here required is 40 feet wide. And the street, including a Cape Cod berm on either side is 22. And I'm not even sure when you're talking about something that might cut through the property that we call the plaza, whether that is too onerous to get the kind of thing we might want to see in the interior. Mm -hmm. No, we can think about that, you know, trying to match the design of the street to the function it's going to serve. Mm -hmm. um, but that is, I mean, that'll be a discussion. That's a bigger discussion with um, yeah. the, you know, the fire chief and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and what the, what the town, because the, you know, the usual progression is that when a street, and we use that like capital S, a street mm -hmm. is, 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 developed then it's accepted right it becomes the property of the town um, and so that often raises questions with folks about you know how is it built how is it designed um, and you know those can be challenging discussions because a lot of folks want to see it over designed you know they, they want the assurance that if a you know if a tornado rips through there that the, the street's going to be perfectly intact afterwards um, and, and passable but um, so we can we can think about that. But that is a larger discussion. Why don't we um, Why don't we at least draft some language that talks about the relationship of the street to its function? Um, Great. Try to think that through, um, and then and then we'll have to you know pass that by a larger audience. I think. Thank you. I think it's it's also if the concern is about the ability to subdivide lots in a way that makes the development in the rear of a, what is currently a large and deep lot and subdividable um, so that you could sell development in the rear. Um, it may not be a street design issue. It may be a lot shape and size issue. There are such things as flag lots. There are a number of different sort of uh, terms of art for this, but basically it is a normal size lot in the rear with a tiny little strip that continues all the way to the front to the public right of way. And it might include access and it might not, but it does usually include some utility run or something. But all that is to say, I don't, I don't know that solving the street standard question is necessary, or the street standard question isn't necessarily how to solve the flexibility of development in the rear of lots. Okay. But, but I would also suggest that I think big picture, we want to advocate for converting this to a series of streets and blocks in a walkable pattern akin to, you know, the historic, more historic portion of Falmouth. So I do think we should be encouraged, we should be discouraging things like flag lots 
where somebody gets really creative and tries to put in a minimal amount of frontage and you have a lot of things sort of tucked in and behind each other. So, um, you know, I, I think it is an issue we need to kind of think through. I, I also, Nate, you know, the dimensions that we've, we've given here, you couldn't do on-street parking. We've just had a big, long conversation about the importance of on-street parking and for providing new streets. Wouldn't it be great if they also had the option of new parking? So, you know, maybe we, maybe we regulate the, the various components and let someone build up to the right of way they want. The street must be 20, minimum 22 feet wide or maximum 22 feet wide, depending on your opinion. It's minimum sidewalk width, minimum tree planter width, minimum on street parking with and then if you want to add that all up and do parking on both sides of the street that's going to be one thing if you don't want to do any on street parking that's another um and maybe regulate it by the components rather than the overall assembly then trying to describe how you're subdividing the overall assembly just another thought mm -hmm. so jeremy just to sort of um i guess piggyback on that idea would it be that you know the the developer would then just like the parking situation, basically propose something to uh, to the say the planning board, and then we would get to consume it, or they would get to consume it and sort of um, you know work with them on the design. Is that the idea? I, I think that is the idea, and, and and we've we've done this. Jeremy and I did this in a, one of our previous uh, projects where. You know, we we provided language on again, like the intent of what we're trying to do, and then there, I think there was like four different street sections that showed different configurations. You know, some had had a bike lane, some of it had on street parking. You know, and it just said, okay, like this is how this works. These these four diagrams meet the intent of of this bylaw, um, and these elements are not you know they're interchangeable so kind of go forward with that i guess the other question would be nate are we imagining when you propose a new street that it's a public it becomes a public street and well we need that to is, differentiate public versus private and maybe there's more flexibility if it's a private street versus a i don't street. i don't know what falmouth's policies are on on private streets um so some towns just don't allow it like they're just like no if you're going to build a street you're going to build a street to our standards and then we're going to accept it. Um, and that's it. Cause it takes away the, the, the ambiguities around maintenance and, and sort of things like that. Other communities do allow for private streets and there are certain assurances that go with that. Um, so that I would, I would need to just get a better handle on what Falmouth wants and, and what they, what they are willing to accept. Um, but yeah. I think in something like this, Nate, that it'd have to be a public street, but in, in our subdivisions, most of them that we have now, they are private streets and they have to provide for their own snow plowing and garbage pickup. Okay. Uh, I just want to mention, we are putting 28 units on Kendall Lane, which is going to be a private road. There'll be mm -hmm. a homeowners association that has to take care of cutting the grass on either end. It's mm -hmm. $65 a month and a long range replacement of the street, which is always going to be the homeowner's responsibility, mm -hmm. but the town has already agreed to provide snow removal and trash pickup. Streets just okay. being built right now. Okay. It's just so always there. good. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, it's always good to keep in mind that things start out private and then later on, you know, folks often want us to take it over and our list for those is, you know, long okay. enough that all of this rework of Davis Straits will be done before we work through the current list. Um, <laughs> so it's just important to keep in mind, it always sounds good in the beginning that it's gonna be private. And then it usually, you know, things change later on. Yeah, pe people start fighting in homeowners associations and mm -hmm. some people don't pay. And then, you know, it just erodes over time. We've heard that a lot with the stormwater infrastructure and things like that. So yeah, I, I can see that Megan. It's, it's, it's almost like it's a matter of time before they're saying, please take this road. Exactly. So I think in this instance, we shouldn't contemplate private. Okay. So when we go with that, we will, you know, kind of approach it sort of the same way as the parking. Um, we'll, you know, speak to the intent of this, um, the, the variety of situations that one might encounter, provide some sections um, for applicants to consider, and then put it in the hands of the town to approve.
All right, good discussion. All right, now the fun stuff, the design standards. So we have, I think, I'm just gonna scroll really quickly. Uh, the, the 12 design standards that we've included here. Uh, well, some of this is preamble language. So we have um, the purpose of these um, and the applicability. Um, so basically these are universally applicable, um, you know, as they apply. So if you're not building a new building, then building form is not gonna apply and that's understood. Um, if you're not putting in a new sign, then signage is not gonna apply and that's understood. Uh, but for whatever improvements you're making, whatever you're developing, um, these are applicable. And so, you know, at the beginning of this project, you know, we sort of talked about the different skills that uh, the different focus that Horsley Witten versus Union Studio brings. So here's a perfect example of, you know, we've Union Studio and HW have worked on this language a lot together um, over uh, multiple projects. Um, but we have not included any diagrams here yet because we wanted to have this discussion about the narrative um, and see where we land on a bunch of this. But there is certainly a few places where um, Union Studio can help us, you know, bolster some of this uh, with different diagrams and illustrations that make the, the intent more clear. Uh, so with that, why don't we look at, you know, these first two here, the building form, um, and the roof form. And again, these are sort of basic. Um, the the multi-story buildings just talks about this concept of articulation. Um, and so this is one of those things that often um, distinguishes between what is, you know, more quote unquote traditional forms versus more contemporary forms. Um, so with more traditional architecture, you usually see um, changes in the, you know, as the, as the stories go up, if you have a two-story or a three-story building, there's a feature in the trim or the change in materials or the shape of the building um, that articulates that. And that sort of, you know, ensures that there's texture to it and it makes it more human scale. Um, the second one here is where we talked about in our last piece, we talked about this idea of um, whether or not we're going to allow residential on the first floor. And that's a conundrum that we haven't fully solved yet. Um, but we all seem to agree that that first floor is going to be, you know, that ceiling is going to be 11 feet. Yeah. Um, because what no, that, that's kind of a tall residential ceiling. But what that ensures is that if that is going to go back and forth between residential and commercial, it can do so without any major constraints to that commercial operation. Um, and, and for what it's worth, 11 is pretty minimal. I, yeah. you know, ideally that'd be more like 13, but we were trying to be reasonable spanning the gap there between what may really be residential without having enormous ceilings versus what would be commercial. But I don't know if anybody has a strong opinion on that, but I think 11 is a, an okay standard, but I would love for 12 or 13 feet if we thought we were able to stomach it. But. This last sentence here, we, we do not have a four-story building allowance here. Um, so we may reduce this to three, the, the, the recess, um, but this is something that we have um, often used um, where if, you know, if a building gets to a certain height, then there's a little bit of a recess on that uh, uppermost story. And again, that sort of reduces the massing, the visual massing of the building. Um, this may be a sentence that comes out, um, but we wanted to have it in there just so you understood the principle, depending on how high we allow our buildings to go. If we're only going to go to three stories, um, then there's probably not a need for this. Well, right now we're limited to three stories, but one of the things that we had discussed with being able to get the density we want to make it more financially feasible for people mm -hmm. to come in and do this and give little pocket parks is perhaps to allow some four story buildings as you get further back into the property. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I don't think I'd wanna 
even think about eliminating at this point until we yeah. got it out for more public discussion with it as jim was saying some kind of a visual that we can present what we're talking about yep. no and that's that's definitely why we wanted to keep it in there because we wanted to keep it in play yeah let's be focused. Although, just because we're on the point i would advocate for instead of the sort of setback idea which i find can be sort of a fussy detail and isn't typical of more traditional sort of urbanism if maybe if it's if you're allowing a fourth floor it must be a half story where, it, where it's sort of within the volume of the roof which is a much more traditional way of of doing a similar sort of thing but you know that that little setback becomes you know a water issue it's you know it has a host of challenges and you, you find that in sort of very mm -hmm. urban sort of places and it is a clever strategy in the right sort of context but i'm thinking in this particular context it might make more sense to just require the fourth floor to be a half story if allowed under whatever conditions we set where that's a possibility. Yeah, I think you're right. Okay, great. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah. All right. Um, this third one here, um, again, is is uh, is an articulation issue, uh, but this is more, you know, running horizontally across the plane. Um, basically, we just don't want large, uh, flat, uh, featureless surfaces. You know, so you know a lot of you know developers may may want to forget about a certain side of the building because they don't think it's highly vis visible. Maybe a little value engineering goes on, um, and that just becomes a big long blank space. And we just want to make sure we we uh, stay away from that and provide some texture. And then the final one here is, you know, that the front facade looks like a front facade. Um, it may seem strange that you have to say it, but we just want to make sure it's clear um, that if your building is fronting on a on an active street, then it looks like the front of a building. Um, so that's that. And when we get to roof forms, um, we've called for traditional New England roof forms. And again, this is a placeholder here. Um, but the gables, the hips, the gambrels, mansards, parapet walls, we can talk about what people like and what they don't like or what, they're, what they expect. Um, but if we do have flat roofs, we can discuss whether that's appropriate. Um, there's the importance of having a parapet wall, um, you know, to give it that, you know, again, that edge, that flared edge um, and strengthen the composition of the building. Uh, with a renovation project, um, you know, maintaining that existing form, uh, giving them that out, where new forms are being added, incorporate dormers that are of a similar slope. So again, just some very sort of basic architectural um, practices here. Do we have any anticipation that we're thinking about, would, how would we feel about someone who wanted to put in a roof deck? My idea, Tony. Good, good. That's the same question. Go ahead. What do folks think? Well, I can tell you that if it's a shorter building, some restaurants might like to have a deck up there. And it's kind of interesting. People enjoy that. And, and, and I honestly believe there's going to be some tremendous water views mm -hmm. looking down the valley to the harbor. Mm -hmm. that uh, should be could be taken advantage of in value. <coughs> and I don't think the building code takes into consideration, they look at the ridge line of where the structure is and they look at the superstructure for equipment or roof decks or everything, widow's walks which I've built, don't get counted in building height in the, under a traditional zoning now. So we should keep our, we should let the developer work with that and see what they can come up with. But if we're going to limit business to the first floor, that would not allow the kind of thing that I'm envisioning. Uh, are we no, limiting it to the first really floor, saying where decks. we want it on the first floor know. at least? Right now, you're okay. not limiting it to the first floor. Commercial could okay. go anywhere. It's just the residential uses that you're trying not to have on the ground floor. Um, and I like the way this is written. This does not preclude uh, a roof deck uh, or okay. using using the roof. It's just really a matter of the visual form 
uh, that the pedestrian sees. Um, but anything that's happening behind that, you could certainly have uh, a roof deck <clears throat> as well, written. You know, as you have said, how the barrier between the sidewalk and a parking lot, something like that, if you wanted to have a roof deck up there that's completely usable, that kind of thing could be a safety measure up there on the roof deck and look very attractive. I want to point out that our newly passed multifamily bylaw <clears throat> allows for non just residential uses on the first floor if they want to build them so we got to be you know if we're going to say you got to we'll be cutting into i've always promised the john drooley and the other people that worked on that that we would not take away the rights that they have and i believe they have on the multifamily district you don't have to it's encouraged to have mixed use but if they really want to have residential they think they can do it so that would that would be a, a take back of something we just passed. That multifamily is a specific district, Jim, or it's allowed in. It's an overlay. It's an overlay. It's specific to this district. Mm -hmm. It's limited to B1, B2, and business redevelopment that are on the sewer anywhere in Falmouth, and it's only what we're talking about right here. Mm -hmm. Well, it's downtown and yeah. all of Davis Straits. Mm -hmm. And ends, it goes, it continues all the way, really the extreme end of Davis Straits is in T-Ticket with the, where the Sandwich Road split off is, but it, it's, it covers all the way up to the mall and Walmart mm -hmm. and everything on, on the corridor. It's all sewered properties that are both B2. So anyways, I think we should take that. I don't think we can take that back. We're, I, I, I think we can make it all work. I don't well, think it's that, a problem. A, it's something we need to plan on. That's a great, excellent observation that we had not made yet. So I'm glad you called that out. Well, we just passed the bylaw a couple yeah. of days ago. So are we suggesting we can't require commercial on the ground floor anywhere? That's that's a that's a drastic shift from the way we've been talking about this district. Yes, it is, but you know what? I think the market should tell us that too. I I, I think that if if we're telling a property owner that he must put, well, it doesn't. It could be non-residential uses. It doesn't have to be right. pure retail. But I mean, what do we? In form-based code, we're not supposed to be telling them. We give them the shape of the building. This is the way we want it to look and not get so much into the uses. That's and, true, uh, except that there was, there was also a stated goal in making the, at least along Davis Straits, be a continuation of the sort of mixed use character of the village. And we were trying to be clear about once you get sort of off of that street, and we were still trying to figure out how to best define that, it was okay if it was all residential. Because the concern is that the market will probably suggest it all wants to be residential. So now you've got to be prepared for having an entirely residential district here if you haven't somehow requested or required that. So, you know, the market might want four-story buildings, but we're telling the market we only want two or three here. So it's not as if it's a it's all open and fair game. I, this is a critical clarification, I think, because you're, you're right, we need to make sure legally we're not suggesting something we're not allowed to suggest based on what you've done. I'm just pointing out that that's a pretty big shift, I think. I, I agree, but I also have a strong belief I, that, the, that the real estate speaks for itself. If it has the right amount of traffic, foot traffic, and downtown, we, you don't see too many people trying to two apartments on the first floor of downtown right. Falmouth, but they could if they want to. It just doesn't make financial sense. So I think, you know, I understand the point, but uh, I think that that... Uh, The, 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 uh, I think the, 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 the tra if we build the streets right, with the right amount of traffic and flow and pedestrian traffic, that the, the first floor on most of it, unless, unless we create a park or some other area, but I think it'll be all right. Would a way to you know, help with that, going back in time, we talked about that first floor uh, story height. Could we just make that tall enough that it sort of 
to fact Absolutely. that discourages. That's, that's taken into consideration. That's what I believe that that having the higher ceiling, you know, does does that. And the the I, you know, I I think the uses will come to us where we want them with the, with the traffic. They're there now. You don't see anyone putting apartments on the first floor up and down the street. They have apartments all on the second floor. That's that's just what the market says. But, but those are also existing buildings. And I would say that it's it's a much easier lift to build an entirely residential building than a mixed use building. And so if you're removing any sort of requirement of that, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you find yourself getting a whole lot of multifamily and not a whole lot of commercial unless you're somehow, you know, that, and that's where I think we were trying to suggest we were only limiting that to certain areas, the key, the crucial areas for that to exist, not the entire district. I think that was an important clarification, but. I actually think Jeremy's right that the, uh, if the limitation that we discussed in the last meeting was really basically that it's on 28 itself, but not anywhere else, it, that makes some sense because today the market would build all residential once a bunch of people have proven that particularly if we got on street parking that the value is there then what you're saying jim would occur but maybe it, you know maybe half of it would be you'd, you'd be have all these missing teeth where residential got built on the street because that's what the market would demand today so I think there's merit to the, to the point and the question is how little, where are the places we really care about? And if it's just the frontage on 28, then there's a choice to be made. And we discussed last time, it might even be smaller than the entire frontage of 28. It may be nodes along 28, depending on how strongly you feel about this. And maybe we can do that with incentives, but you know, I, yes, I'm in agreement with everybody, but I'm just saying, you know, when we passed this multifamily bylaw, Davis Straits wasn't in there yet. So uh, we, we want it to fit everywhere. And so it does. And I just have to, we, if we take back uh, modest areas along the, 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 the main road, that's totally, we can maybe do it in the design, ceiling heights, whatever. But yes, I'm, I'm just laying it out there. I read the bylaw three times today. I had a, you could, somebody else could check it, but I'm pretty sure that's what we we passed. So I just want to bring that up. But Jim, it is an overlay. And if this is going to supplant because it becomes a new bylaw for that area, then if town meeting votes this, it takes the place of that overlay. So it may be a moot point if we get what we want on this. I'm not sure, Pat, doesn't an overlay district leave the pre-existing zoning in place? Yes, it does. But what I'm saying is that as we were envisioning it, we wanted this to replace any zoning that was there. This would not be an overlay. Yeah, Pat's correct. So if if you pass this as a new district, okay. the overlay would not apply because you did not the overlay, the overlay gets wiped out. Okay, I got mm -hmm. it, right. I agree. So, so there's not, there really, I don't want it to be a conflict, and I don't think it will be if we get what we want on this. Okay, everyone's got a heads up. I agree. I, I agree. I'm not arguing either way. I'm just saying yeah. what the facts are. It's a great heads up. It really is. Is that um, is that new bylaw available yet on the internet, or is that something? Uh, Jed, it should be. Says? I've actually. Jed, I've been waiting all day. It wasn't posted by four this afternoon. Have you reposted it? No, it should be there. I, it should okay. be there and, and the new map is there. I can send the link after the meeting. Yeah. Yeah, Jed and I have been going through correcting uh, the maps and everything because when we passed it by town meeting, there was an amendment and that amendment wasn't really originally reflected in all the drawings and everything, but I think we've got it all set, ready to go and share with everybody. Sounds like today. All right, great. I had one more comment on building form, just for, for at least uh, my instinct. 20 feet is tiny in terms of a straight wall. That's it, it it's, uh, you know, there are very few commercial establishments that actually exist in less than 20 feet of frontage. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I think in other places, Nate, sometimes we bump that up to like 60 feet. Okay. And I'm, I'm just trying to picture what you find on the existing Falmouth Main Street. You probably would find a number of facades that are you know, in that sort of 50, 60 foot range. And it's not to say you can't design a beautiful facade that's 300 feet long. We're just, we're banking on the fact that the average Schmel might not get that quite right. Sounds good. Okay, so let's go to entrance ways. Um, this one is, you know, again, one that uh, one would think goes without uh, without saying, but um, just want to make sure that we have a door that works that looks like a front door. I'll be the nitpicker for just a moment. Sure, Tony. Uh, it says, must be designed to appear to be mm -hmm. the principal point of entry as opposed to be the principal point of entry. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, if we had on-street parking, I'd say it should be it. And if we don't, then it has to only appear to be it. Okay. Yeah, I think if you don't require it in the parkings in back, we know where the entrance would go. And that would sort of work counter to what you're trying to achieve with these streetscapes. So I think you, I think it's important. And I think, yeah, maybe the getting rid of the appear to be where yeah. I, it suggests I could put something that looks like a door and then you go up and you can't actually open it. It's what we're trying to, you know, we don't want that per se. Yeah, but if you just be, take you know. the word appear out, it is a principle, it is a point of entry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that letter B covers the appearance, sort of expands on, I think, what the original intent was of that. So we can switch that first one. So I think I think number six is one that's worth discussion. Um, you know, so I think we, in our earliest discussions, we sort of talked about, we often div divide our design standards into like a few broad categories, like the things you have to have, the things we think you really should have, and then the things that, well, kind of up to you. Um, and, you know, this discussion of materials, um, a lot of communities feel strongly about this, and and you know the, the 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 language that's provided here reflects some of those discussions that we've had, you know, with other communities. Uh, but I was sort of interested to get your feeling on this, your comfort level of whether you think that this is a little too much, or do you think that this is something that's important. Okay, when you say untinted windows, um, some stores really do need to have some tinting. Do we want to specify degree of tinting so that there's no fade of the merchandise from sun? I don't think the solar issue is a factor anymore. They now have coatings or windows that can take out all UV damage, it's more or less the, the total look of the facade, the fenestrations, the percentage of open area. And I think this is, a, I don't know the answer, but I'm really hoping that the design team can come give us something that really makes the buildings look good. And blank walls with no openings or fenestrations or doors or anything aren't very inviting to people. So if it's visible from the street, uh, I, I'm going to list, like to hear what the design key, team can come up with on that. That's what I like to see. We, okay, we but does does forty percent of the facade being window space make sense to you, Jim? Would you want to have more? I I I, I, I don't know for sure, but I know okay. uh, my my experience is limited. I built uh, half a dozen buildings, but I, they're all beautiful. And they all have shitload of windows. <laughs> yeah. 
So that's my experience. I'll, I'll leave it up to design professionals to, to help us uh, put the parameters in. But I know uh, that's the way I feel about it. And it's a, I mean, I think, I guess maybe we'll see some examples of what that looks like. But, you know, if you're thinking about leaving real flexibility for what the function of these spaces is going to be, you know, I think if it's a, you know, I feel the same way a little bit about the tinting of the windows. If there's a gym that's on a first floor, maybe there's some level of tint because nobody wants to work out while everyone's staring at them like a fishbowl. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, you know, we don't want to be so prescriptive that we then, you know, limit and, and really kind of cut off the whole realm of possibility. So um, I like that we're you know, I don't, I don't see so much specificity here, but, and I think you've picked on some key, key things that probably are not, um, you know, necessarily, you know, the, the sheet metal or, you know, that type of reflective, maybe that's something that folks don't like, but I, I hope that we leave it wide enough that developers have some options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, I guess I would even suggest that I think what we're trying to define is the buy right typical condition. So it's certainly not to say if someone wanted to open a gym and it made sense to tint the windows, they couldn't come in front of mm -hmm. you and say, hey, we want to tint the windows because and you'd say, oh, yeah, it makes sense. Right. And so it, it goes yes. through. So, yep. you know, there, there will always be sort of outstanding conditions where you say, oh, you're right. It's OK that you have slightly less, but that's because you talked it through with us. And you, you that could be a film applied outside our parameters of scope on mm -hmm. the inside window. You know, they could do that at any time. Mm -hmm. When we say that all windows shall align and be consistent in proportion, shape, and overall style, is this on one building or is this the whole line of buildings? Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not quite getting good, it. Good question. That is one building. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess the follow up question is are we going to ask? Um, future proposals to consider or provide um, illustrations of not only what their building looks like, but also the relationship to the adjacent buildings? I think you can. I mean, I always get a little cautious when I ask an applicant for information about adjacent properties, um, because that can be hard to get and sort of what like you know, what level of detail are you asking for? I mean, you can, there are ways to do it, you know, like they can do it with a photo simulation. They can just take a picture and sort of, so you just want to be careful about, you know, how you ask for it. So, you know, I, in these types of districts, I always like to ask for, you know, the architectural elevations. And we haven't talked about, you know, the content of the application yet. Um, but, you know, the elevation certainly gives you the building that they're going to build. Um, but if, if there's going to be some sort of examination, I mean, that's probably something you and I can talk about offline, Jeremy, is like, what's the, what's the easiest, best way to get good information, you know, relative to the buildings next door, that, that kind of thing. And I, and I would say there's probably more pressure for that when you're in a district where most of the buildings there are pretty nice. And we're in a district where we're kind of hoping people are starting over, you know, like, do, do we really need to see the liquor store that's over a hundred feet and set 300 feet back in, you know, like, are we, what are we trying to riff off of? Or what are we trying to, I, I don't think it's unre an unreasonable, um, um, you know, request during a submission, you know, can you show us what in a condition where that makes sense? But you know, I, was, I was just trying to picture it in this particular context where the existing context is pretty hit or miss. Is that really even useful information in some cases? Well, we have D there, which gives us, the capacity to say, no, your facade just doesn't look right. Because it says it has to be a, the appearance of wood, brick, or stone, and may be painted or coated in a non-metallic finish that complements, but not necessarily matches the colors used on adjacent buildings. So that does give us some flexibility in design review.
Yeah, and then we, you know, when we were having these discussions many, many years ago, you know, the uh, the simulated materials were not nearly as good as they are today. I mean, there's some really good stuff out there now. So we've sort of gotten away from, you know, being prescriptive on that end. Not, I mean, I think not, it's better. I, I, I've had to take AZAC and triple it up to get the structural strength and firmness you need to make it work. So I think the newer products are even better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it sounds like we can make some tweaks to this, but nothing people are generally comfortable with, right. with what we've got here. All right, pedestrian and bicycle circulation. And so this, you know, basically, and, and this is a great one for diagrams in terms of showing like different materials and, and things like that, that we've done. Um, but, you know, basically we're, we're saying that where pedestrians are really supposed to, you know, have the run of the space that space needs to, to be designed to reflect that. And, and even where cars may cross over or where they may temporarily share space, um, there's just ways to do that that provide really good visual cues um, to motorists and others um, that this is, this is a, a space primarily dedicated to pedestrians or bikes. I just want to uh, remind everybody it's 8.15, um, so. All right, we're getting there. Yeah. I think the only thing that, you know, I, I'm not, again, I'm not sure it really falls into this category, but the whole idea of bike parking. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think that might just be handled somewhere else, but that's, to me is, is very important. Yeah, I mean, that would be something that if, if it was gonna be required, um, then it would just get included in the, in the parking report. Yeah. All right, let's go to landscaping then. So again, here, there are town-wide standards for landscaping. Um, and this may be, I mean, certainly we'll take any comments that folks may have on this language, um, but, you know, we're, we're trying to make a clear break here between the landscaping standards we have here and those for the, for the town, um, not being critical of the ones that they have, but we're just trying to make this kind of one-stop uh, shopping here. And... So we talk about sight lines, you know, plant choice, you know, no invasive species allowed, um, native species. You know, this is this stuff is pretty easy now um, in terms of, you know, landscape professionals of, of all levels, um, you know, understanding what this language means and having access um, to really good stock. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion with landscape professionals, installation folks over the years. They've read standards like this and they sort of just shrug their shoulders, like, sure, this looks fine, um, because they kind of all understand how this works. Number nine, um, so we, I don't think we've, made any clear choice about whether or not there's gonna be parking structures allowed, um, but we wanted to provide some language to show you um, that if we were going to allow for structured parking, these are the types of standards that we've applied to those, because uh, there is a wide range 
of parking facility design. Um, and I think we've probably all seen that in our travels, some like really super basic concrete decks. And then there's some really fancy stuff out there that has, you know, active ground floor use um, and much more sophisticated design. Because, um, because parking is, um, uh, I'm probably not gonna state this right. It's not beneficial for whomever is going to build the buildings that we're envisioning here for residential and business. It's not beneficial for them to put their hard earned money into a parking garage structure. So it would have to be looked at as a public amenity. So my question then comes down to, are there grants available to towns that are doing this kind of redevelopment that would allow them to at least gain some compensation to put in a parking garage? Because I think that would be the best way of handling it, a multi-story parking, parking garage. I will say this, and, and even though we're being recorded, don't quote me. <laughs> I, am, I am fairly confident that mass development has assisted municipalities with the construction of parking garages. And those are probably very, I mean, mass development works on a very site specific basis. So they probably don't have a parking garage funds program. You know, they provide the assistance that, you know, a town applies for. Oops, excuse me, my light went off. And, and they go from there. So, so I do believe that there have been instances in Massachusetts where funding has been provided for structured parking. Um, and so if you were to engage uh, an agency like Mass Development, you know, you would bring all of these plans forward and they fund all types of communities, you know, affluent suburbs and, you know, urban core areas, all of the above um, to, to do work like this. And so you could, you could make a contact with your regional connection at Mass Development and show them all this work that we've done that will count for a lot and say, we're not sure we can make this work without a parking garage and we wanna to talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. They may have that conversation with you. You know, they're, okay. out there to, they're, they're out there to help municipalities. You know, we're, we're an on-call contractor with them. So we've worked on all kinds of different projects where they're, you know, just, again, they're just trying to move this stuff forward. They're trying to be that gap financing, that, that agency that maybe solves that one problem that sort of opens things up. Um, so there, there may be an opportunity there. Well, the reason I'm saying this, Nate, that is if we're talking about having zip cars, mm -hmm. if we're talking about having charging stations, it would be beneficial to have this under cover, not just out in the open. Mm -hmm. um, so I see that as one use of a parking garage. And to have people be able to park under cover there and to stack it allows for more usage of what we're envisioning here too. Without question. But I think we also don't, you know, I, I hope we kind of explore what, you're, what you were just talking about, Nate. But I also think depending on what a development looks like, the developer might want to maximize, you know, that space that they have um, and which in turn may require then some type of parking lot, right? So if they're going to sort of build out from a commercial, then what's left in order to have parking to actually accommodate that, that development may have to be um, some type of parking structure. So, I, I, you know, I can see it happening maybe a couple different ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th there's... You know, where we've seen individual projects making investments, it's usually been in underground parking, like so they'll sort of tuck things underneath. And, and, and we've seen projects that seem to be able to make that work. Um, but stacked parking is super expensive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've probably heard some of the numbers where, you know, 
people are building parking garages for like forty thousand dollars a space you know that like that kind of thing um so I was just talking to another community earlier this week where they were like it's double that they're getting quotes of seventy eighty thousand yeah. dollars yeah so super expensive stuff um so it does tend to happen as you know a shared sort of district amenity uh type thing um that's that's meant to generate some money you know it's a fee fee-based uh facility uh that that's how this stuff is usually rolling out is there a parking deck anywhere on the cape today it's it's, it's a funny thing i, I you know maybe you there's one it. cape there cod one? cape cod five just built a new building off of 132 and it has a garage hmm. yeah a beautiful one <laughs> So I, I guess, it, again, it, it, maybe it's worth keeping in in the off chance it happens. I feel like basically with the exception of the largest parcel that's out there, I don't imagine there's many scenarios for a private developer to contemplate a parking deck and have it make any sort of sense if the town was going to consider it. And, and, you know, that might be a different scenario, but maybe there's no harm in including it here. I just, I don't imagine, I, it, it's hard to imagine a scenario where one's actually going to get built here, but. And if we ignore it, then we're not trying to encourage such a thing even into the future. Mm -hmm. So perhaps it does have a place being kept in here. I know when the hospital put an addition on, we really were pressuring them to put a parking garage there, and they said they couldn't afford to do it. All right, so we'll leave these in here for now. Um, surface parking lot design. Uh, so, you know, we talked about this again in those earlier diagrams. We looked at one spot as, a, as an illust illustrative example that, you know, would, from a design perspective, um, might make a good surface parking lot installation and would serve a whole ring of properties around it, you know, and give it some of that flexibility that we're looking for. Um, so again, this as, a, as an individual use, this may never be installed, um, but, you know, along the same lines as a parking garage, we want you to get a sense of, you know, what these design standards would look like. Is the standard that's uh, denoted for access drives different than the standard that exists in the rest of the bylaw for parking spaces? And is there a minimum parking space size? I don't, there's no minimum parking space size in this, this section that we've drafted, Tony. I don't know. Um, I don't know if the larger bylaw has it or if that would apply here. That's a good question. I thought the bylaw does have a, a minimum parking spot, but it, you know, I yep. could try and fish through it to find it. But. It does. And also, haven't we gone to a 25 feet wide um, traffic way because the vehicles are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it was more and more difficult to get in and out of spaces when it was 24 feet? So I, I think, think we added 24. another foot. Is it still 24? I, I think it is. Uh, the last one I looked at was 24. Because I thought we added on to that, Jim. And it could have been just specifically for some of the more recent. They didn't have to, but we were strongly recommending. I just really think we did. There's a diagram in the zoning under parking, and it shows the lanes and the setbacks there. And I believe that has not changed, that that's still okay. 24. That's okay. what I'm talking about. Have we done it for a particular site? Yes. OK. But there's a, I don't know this, I don't know the numbers, but there's a chart. And it has the design and it's 20, I, my best recollection is 24. And you're better than I am on that, Jim. You know the bylaws really well, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trying to get back those Ford F-350s out. All right, so we'll check that for consistency. On the other hand, do we wanna make it 25 in this area? 
because remember, this wouldn't be an overlay. We'd be specifically, it's not referring to our bylaws here. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we wanted to restrict it to small electric cars. I don't know, but we got to take it into know. consideration. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like the aisle width is 24. Okay. Nate, you have access to all that, right? Yeah, and I think we took a lot of this language from there okay. to try to be consistent. It's hard to remember exactly um, where a lot of this, whether this was from a previous draft we had done, but, you know, looking at the level of detail here, I have a feeling that we took a lot of what you have on the books already. I mean, the only one that uh, might run counter to in goes to that discussion that we had about how wide a space do we want to create for one of those accesses where you say yeah. the travel lane can't be within five feet of a building. So you, you're sort of creating a a minimum opening of uh, the width of the travel lane plus five feet each side. It goes back to that whole discussion we just had about the difference between a drive and a road and so on. Mm -hmm. Right, we can look at that. Hey, Jed, you brought up bicycle parking at C here. Bicycle okay. parking or storage spaces are to be located as close as possible to the building entrance or entrances. Yeah, one thing I don't think we have covered is a specific numerical requirements for number of parking spaces for bicycles. Right. Uh, I think that was just an oversight and we, we need to, I, I made a note to go back and add that. Okay. <clears throat> and would we specify sort of uh, the type of bicycle parking too um, in re relation to like, for example, the, um, I'm lo losing the word here, but the uh, stalls or the uh, cages, you know, boxes where you can actually store uh, weather protected uh, facilities for for bicycle parking. Uh, there are other communities where we have said a minimum of X percent of your required bicycle parking has to be covered or indoors. If yeah. that's okay, if that'd be useful. Okay. Because <clears throat> if we're trying to encourage for the residents uh, bicycling, right. one car and bicycling, we want to have them be able to have protection for their bicycles. And, and Nate, I don't remember with the section about the parking plan, you know, again, it, it is also obviously nice to always provide for if you provide some sort of excess of bike parking, you can then minimize the amount of car parking you might require. Mm -hmm. That may be a nice way of encouraging people to minimize sort of the size of the lots, whereas a nice way of getting around when you have a really tight, tough condition, maybe even if you didn't think that was gonna be your solution, you say, oh, I'll do more bike parking and I can get away with less car parking. And that's just gonna be the market for whom I'm trying to market these units to. Right. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it is 8.30. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, one thing I just wanted to share, um, People are already starting to look how to combine properties on Davis Straits. I'm on this already based on the bylaw that we have now. So we need to keep, the, what I heard tonight was absolutely fantastic. The most progress we've had in a long time, but we've got to keep the pace up. It's looking really good. All right, so that's probably a, an excellent preamble to scheduling mm -hmm. what, what might be our final discussion for this draft. I'm assuming we're looking at post holidays. Oh yeah. Is the first week in January off the table? Probably not. After New Year's, people are back here. 
Jim, you're showing a thumbs up. The first week in January is okay or it's off the table? It says good. Okay. Um, I, I have, anytime we need to do it, I'm ready. Okay. Nate and, and uh, Union Studios and folks, do you have availability that week? Uh, the week of the third, it looks like, three through seven. I'm available any any evening that week. Even the seventh, Friday night? <laughs> That's my birthday and no. <laughs> <laughs> so Thursday good seem to you. be good evenings, I think. Don't you, Jed? I agree. How about for you, Frank? Yes, no? Thursdays, okay. Even though he's legitimately retired, right? <laughs> So shall we say the 6th of January? Sure. I don't know if I'm available, but I'll, if I'm not, I'll try and see if Angie is. She's at a um, conference in New Orleans this week. So we've kind of been trying to balance it out. So let's, let's pick it. It works for everyone and we'll make it work. I just have a trial that day. So I just don't know what that night looks like, but we'll make it work. You, Julian? Are you going to make it? It was nice having you here tonight. Oh, you're <laughs> muted. <laughs> Obviously, I've been uh, fundamentally listening, but Thursday the 6th uh, would, would appear to work. Great. Great. Because I think it's Great. critical that you hear what we're up to, too, Julian. <laughs> Happy to do so, finally. I got to go. I'm thrilled with their progress so far. This has been wonderful. Thank you, mm -hmm. everybody. Thank you, everyone. Really, really Thanks, great everyone. stuff. Okay. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Happy holidays, Good night, guys. Everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Take Christmas care. to you Merry all. Christmas.